Post-World War I, in a series of fleet problems, the early carriers demonstrated their effectiveness when they proved their enthusiasts' theories conclusively. In 1928, fleet carrier Langley totally surprised the installations at Pearl Harbor and theoretically achieved significant damage to the area. One year later, the larger carriers proved the same result, with conclusive results again around the Panama Canal. These results were repeated in the years up until World War II in the many trials conducted. Broadly, the results forced the battle groups to begin taking the carrier as a more significant threat to themselves and the outcome of the encounters. These exercises proved their worth in the coming years, with the commanders gaining valuable practice and the crews and pilots honing the skills they would need in the dark years to come. The development of these skills began at the turn of the century with the early concepts of manned flight. By 1909, we were barely able to claim mastery of building petrol-driven four-wheel vehicles, or cars as they became known. Yet some forward thinkers were already adapting the internal combustion engine to powering aircraft. In Virginia, during one of the Wright brothers' subsequent flights of their Kitty Hawk, a naval observer, Lieutenant George Sweet, remarked that the Navy must have that. It will be most important to us. With these words, Sweet basically instigated the joining of air power and naval power. The Navy's first attempts at air power concentrated on taking off and landing on water. In 1910 in Virginia, a civilian pilot named Eugene Healy tested the idea of taking off from a ship and landing on terra firma. He used a wooden ramp built over the bow of a cruiser as a runway for a 50 horsepower Curtis. He was successful and two months later he attempts the reverse, taking off on land and touching down on a ship. The next achievement towards aircraft and their use at sea occurred in 1921, when the US Navy ran bombing tests on captured ships. Brigadier General Billy Mitchell oversaw the operation. The newspapers were quick to announce that with such a weapon as the plane, the day that the battleship was over. The Navy was quick to remind the media and people that the battleship used in the test was a sitting duck. It did not return fire or in any way take defensive action. Directly after the Great War, the world's major navies were to show great enthusiasm in the promise embodied in the airplane. The successful flight of the NC-4 flying boat in May 1919 achieved the first crossing of the Atlantic by air. Just prior to the transatlantic flight, the US Atlantic Fleet began training with their own aviation detachment. Biplanes were launched off a wooden deck erected on the battleship Texas. In a great leap forward during July 1919, the US Navy ordered the Collier Jupiter to be converted into the US Navy's first aircraft carrier. By 1922, the Collier's transformation was complete and had become America's first aircraft carrier. She was rechristened USS Langley. Arresting wires were strung across the deck of the runway and planes were fitted with hooks which would catch the wires and bring the plane to a halt. The first of many problems became apparent. The undercarriages of the planes were simply not strong enough to cope with the rough landings. The strong and lightweight metals of today such as titanium or materials such as carbon fibre were not yet available. So strengthening came at a cost, and the cost was weight. However, some remedies were simple enough and made enough difference to prove that using planes from the Langley was feasible. These included designing planes that gave pilots better visibility over the nose of the plane to give them better judgment when landing, the track of the undercarriage to increase stability and better training procedures. The British were also developing sea takeoffs, and this was one idea, the laying down of a buoyant runway which was not overly successful. The British returned to the more conventional aircraft carrier, and the same problems as the Americans. 
many Vought planes found their way into the Navy's service. Among the models were twin-seat observation planes and float planes, but it was the fighter version that was to establish the company's association with the US Navy. On October 17, 1922, it was a VE-7 that took off for the first time from the decks from the US Navy's original aircraft carrier, the Langley. This marked the long and at times daunting development phase of naval aviation. The requirements for naval aircraft are much more encompassing and demanding than those planes destined for land-based assignment. A pilot requires very good visibility and a tough plane to withstand carrier landings. Because the gap between a landing and a crashing is very narrow, pilots continue to force their planes onto the deck trying to attain a hookup. Early on in the development of carrier aircraft, the Navy filmed many equipment failures. These films stand as a record of the problems that were overcome by the Vought engineers in their achievements of the VE-7 and its subsequent models. Many models after the VE-7 were submitted to the military, although none were taken up in the fighter role. One of the reconnaissance series of these aircraft were called the Corsair. 